All right. Welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. We are on episode 71. We are currently reading Angela Y. Davis, Women, Race, and Class, and we are on chapter 7, Woman's Suffrage at the Turn of the Century, The Rising Influence of Racism. Okay, let's begin at the top of page 122. As racism developed more durable roots within white women's organizations, so too did the sexist cult of motherhood creep into the very movement whose announced aim was the elimination of male supremacy. The coupling of sexism and racism was mutually strengthening, having opened its doors to the prevailing racist ideology more widely than ever before. The suffrage movement had opted for an obstacle course which placed its own goal of women's suffrage in continuous jeopardy. The 1901 convention of the NAWSA was the first in many years at which Susan B. Anthony was not the presiding officer. Having retired the preceding year, she was nonetheless in attendance and was introduced by the new president, Carrie Chapman Catt, to deliver the welcoming message. Anthony's remarks reflected the influence of the rejuvenated eugenics campaign. While women, she argued, have been corrupted in the past by, quote, man's appetites and passions, end quote, it was time for them to fulfill their purpose of becoming saviors of, quote, the race, end quote. It would be through women's, quote, intelligent emancipation that the race shall be purified. It is through women that the race is to be redeemed. For this reason, I ask for her immediate and unconditional emancipation from all political, industrial, and religious subjection, end quote. The main address, delivered by Carrie Chapman Catt, pointed to three, quote, great obstacles, end quote, to woman suffrage, militarism, prostitution, and, quote, the inertia in the growth of democracy, which has come as a reaction following the aggressive movements that with possible ill-advised haste enfranchised the foreigner, the Negro, and the Indian. Perilous conditions seeming to follow from the introduction into the body politic vast numbers of irresponsible citizens have made the nation timid, end quote. By 1903, the NAWSA witnessed such an outburst of racist argumentation that it appeared that the upholders of white supremacy were determined to seize control over the organization. Significantly, The 1903 convention was held in Southern City of New Orleans, was held in the Southern City of New Orleans. Excuse me. It was hardly a coincidence that the racist arguments heard by the delegates were complemented by numerous defenses of the motherhood cult. If Edward Merrick, son of the Louisiana Supreme Court Chief Justice, spoke about, quote, the crime of enfranchising a horde of ignorant Negro men, end quote, Mary Chase, a delegate from New Hampshire, claimed that women should be enfranchised, quote, as the natural guardians and protectors of the home, end quote. At the 1903 convention, it was Bell Kearney from Mississippi whose remarks most blatantly confirmed the dangerous alliance between racism and sexism. Bluntly referring to the Southern black population as the, quote, 4,500,000 ex-slaves, illiterate and semi-barbarous, end quote, she histrionically evoked their enfranchisement as a, quote, death weight, end quote, under which the South has struggled, quote, for nearly 40 years, bravely and magni- magnimis- magni- magnanimously, end quote. Excuse me. However inadequate Booker T. Washington's theory of vocational education for black people may have been in reality, Kearney insisted that Tuskegee and similar schools were, quote, only fitting the Negro for power, and when the black man becomes necessary to a community by reason of his skill and acquired wealth, end quote, something of a race war will result. Quote, the poor white man, embittered by his poverty and humiliated by his inferiority, finds no place for himself and his children. Then will come the grapple between the races, end quote. Of course, no such struggle between white workers and black workers was inevitable. The apologists of the new monopoly capitalist class were, however, determined to provoke these racist divisions. Around the same time that Kearney spoke before the New Orleans Convention, an identical alarm was issued to the U.S. Senate. On February 24, 1903, Senator Ben Tillman from South Carolina warned that colleges and schools for black people in the South would lead inexorably, inexorably, excuse me, to racial conflict. Designed to equip, quote, these people, end quote, who, 
in his eyes were, quote, the nearest to the missing link with the monkey, end quote, to, quote, compete with their white neighbors, end quote, these schools would, quote, create an antagonism between the poor classes of our citizens and these people upon whose level they are in the labor market, in the labor market, end quote. Moreover, quote, there has been no contribution to elevate the white people in the South, to aid and assist the Anglo-Saxon Americans, the men who are descended from the people who fought with Marion and Dumpter. They are allowed to struggle in poverty and in ignorance and to do everything they can to get along, and they see northern people pouring in thousands and thousands to help build up an African domination, end quote. Contrary to Kearney's and Tillman's logic, racial conflict did not emerge spontaneously, but rather con- consciously planned by the representatives of the economically ascendant class. They needed to impede working class unity so as to facilitate their own exploitative designs. The forthcoming, quote, race riots, end quote, Atlanta, Brownsville, Texas, Springfield, Ohio, like the 1898 massacres in Wilmington and Phoenix, South Carolina, were orchestrated precisely in order to heighten the tensions and antagonism within the multiracial working class. Belle Kearney informed her sisters at the New Orleans convention that she had discovered a sure way of containing the racial antagonisms within manageable limits. She claimed she knew exactly how to prevent the otherwise inevitable race war. Quote, to avoid this unspeakable culmination, the enfranchisement of women will have to be affected and an educational and property qualification for the ballot be made to apply. The enfranchisement of women would ensure immediate and durable white supremacy honestly attained. For, upon unquestionable authority, it is stated that in every southern state but one, there are more educated women than all the illiterate voters, white and black, native and foreign, combined. End quote. The utterly horrifying tone of Kearney's address should not conceal the fact that she invoked theories which have become quite familiar within the woman suffrage movement. The statistical argument and the call for a literacy requirement have been heard many times before by delegates to previous NAWSA conventions. In proposing a property qualification for the vote, Kearney reflected the anti-working class ideas which had unfortunately gained a stronghold in the suffrage movement. There was an ironical twist to the words Belle Kearney delivered to the convened membership of the National American Woman Suffrage Association. For years and years, Leading suffragists had justified the association's indifference to the cause of racial equality by invoking the catch-all argument of expediency. Now, woman suffrage was represented as the most expedient means to achieve racial supremacy. The NAWSA had unwittingly caught itself in its own trap, in the trap of expediency which was supposed to catch the vote. Once the pattern of capitulation to racism had taken hold, and especially at that historical juncture when the new and ruthless monopolist expansion required more intense forms of racism, it was inevitable that the suffragists would eventually be hurt by its backfire. The delegate from Mississippi confidently declared, quote, Someday the North will be compelled to look to the South for redemption. On account of the purity of its Anglo-Saxon blood, the simplicity of its social and economic structure, and the maintenance of the sanctity of his faith, which has been kept inviolate. End quote. Not an ounce of sisterly solidarity could be detected here, and there was not a word about the defeat of male supremacy or about women eventually coming into their own. It was not women's rights or women's political equality, but rather the reigning racial superiority of white people, which had to be preserved at all cost. Quote, Just as surely as the North will be forced to turn to the South for the nation's salvation, just so surely would the South be compelled to look to its Anglo-Saxon women as the medium through which to retain the supremacy of the white race over the African. End quote. Quote, thank God the black man was freed. End quote. She exclaimed with deliberate racist arrogance. Quote, I wish for him all possible happiness and all possible progress but not in encroachments upon the holy of holies of the Anglo-Saxon race, end quote. That brings us to the end of chapter seven and the beginning of chapter eight, black women in the club movement. And I think that that chapter pointed out the dangers of, of not 
adequately addressing and absolving racist ideologies, uh, male supremacist ideologies, white supremacist ideologies when they first begin to creep up and uh, the dangers of allowing these things to fester. And we've seen in earlier chapters at the that it started off with the before the women's suffrage movement began to have the uh, notoriety that it had before the women's freedom movement, women's liberation movement began to have the notoriety that it had. It was the abolitionist movement that was at the forefront uh, almost exclusively because of the gravity of the situation when it came to slavery. And we seen even in the midst of that abolitionist movement that there was still a lot of racist ideologies at play. And though it was white women and white, even though that there were white women who, because of the brutality of slavery, because of the, the, just the nature of slavery wanted slavery to be absolved out of the country. They were not in a place where they wanted racism and racist thought patterns and racist ideology to be absolved out of the country. Uh, they didn't want black people to be treated as property, but they also weren't in a place where they were prepared to view black people as human beings. And if they were going to uh, view them as human beings, they viewed them as a lesser version of human beings than they viewed themselves being white. And so and we've seen how Susan B. Anthony and some of the other leaders of the women's suffrage movement and the women's liberation movement, instead of trying to get eradicate those ideas, they capitulated to those ideas in an effort to try to build more political power, which is has been a danger of. Uni almost universally all political parties and political organizations in this country is that when the rubber comes to the road and it's time to be 100 percent anti-racist. That and you have to you have to run the risk of losing whatever alliances may come with that, losing whatever political backing may come with that, losing whatever financial backing may come with that. The majority of organizations and political parties and individuals and businesses in this country capitulate to the racist ideology, capitulate to the uh, the, the racist thought patterns and the white supremacist thought patterns uh, in an effort to get further ahead. And that is how racism works. That is how. Uh, uh, class systems of class work or caste systems work is that in an effort to never be at the bottom, to ne in an effort to never be the lowest of the people in a society, you agree to uh, in an effort so that you are not part of the lowest group or lowest uh, caste system in a society, you make an agreement with other people to keep another group at the bottom. And so white women did not want to go to being at the bottom of the society. They seen black people and slaves and immigrants and uh, indigenous people in this land as all below them, as all uh, at the bottom of the society. And when black people began to be free and slave, we were no, more, no longer enslaved, they began to fear that black men were going to rise higher than white women in the society. And so in an effort to make sure that they did not fall at the to the bottom of the, the caste system in the society, uh, they agreed to do things that would keep black people at the bottom of that society in the bottom caste system. And and, and to this day, that is still something that uh, happens with a, a, a regularity is uh, whether it be poor white people, working class white people, uh, white women is pointed out in here. These different groups that uh, uh, agree with racist ideology or that compromise and capitulate to racist ideology in an effort to get ahead, in an effort to uh, keep themselves from being uh, in the bottom of the, the, the society. And so. Those are all some of the things that uh, I, were pointed out there. And I think that we have to be able to uh, articulate how different groups of have done that in the country in the past to try to articulate why we can't allow those things to, uh, again, happen in the future. Mm. And I think that as we another thing that stands out to me is as we're getting closer and closer to current times, again, just the the at every turn the different type of racist rhetoric that's being put out the different type of racist ideology racist thought patterns and how these things uh how they how these things have uh altered or or shifted or began to look a little bit different now than they looked uh 
uh, look different in the beginning of the 1900s than they may have looked at the beginning of the 1800s or in the midst of the 1700s. And I think that when you can identify the way that these these thought patterns and these policies and belief systems change throughout time, you can well, you can get to 2021 and see how they have shifted and changed now and you can articulate the commonalities between them. Uh, and so to me, one of the things that stands out is the commonalities between we started out with with slavery and some of the slave killings that uh, came and some of the killings of uh, uh, during slave revolts that came about. And uh, then we fast forward and get to the some of the Jim Crow lynchings and some of the uh, the vigilante killings and mob lynchings and mob murders that have happened and that were happening. Ida B. Wells put at uh, 100 to 200 times annually a year and you can see how those things connect to the police killings that happen with regularity uh, now that happen disproportionately to black people now uh, one of the other things that began to be uh, very begin to be highlighted in that last chapter is the rise of imperialism the rise of america going into other countries and to other nations and uh enforcing their ideology and their belief systems onto these other peoples in these other nations. Uh, uh, also the capitalism, we begin to see more of an expansion of capitalism towards the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. And I just think that all of those different things have to come into play to understand the, the nature of the situation that we're in currently, the racism, capitalism, uh, imperialism, and, and of course the, uh, misogyny and male supremacist uh, thought patterns that exist as well, and how all of four and how all of these different things feed off of each other and and strengthen each other and embolden each other. Okay, let's start chapter eight. Black women in the club movement. I've been trying to get through these chapters through one episode at a time. I sort of feel like maybe we should end this episode. Come back, start on chapter eight. Uh, no, nah, let's start chapter eight, and then we we uh, end this episode somewhere in the midst of this chapter. Chapter eight, Black Women in the Club Movement. The General Federation of Women's Clubs could have celebrated its 10th birthday in 1900 by taking a stand against racism within its ranks. Unfortunately, its stance was unequivocally pro-racist. The convention's credentials committee decided to exclude the black delegate sent by Boston's Women's Era Club. Among the scores of the clubs represented in the Federation, the one club deemed inadmissible carried a mark of distinction which could be claimed by no more than two of the white women's groups. If cirrhosis and the New England Women's Clubs were pioneer organizations among white club women, the Women's Era Club then five years old was the fruit of black women's first organizing efforts within the club movement. Its representative, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, was known in white club circles in Boston as a, quote, cultured, end quote, woman. She was the wife of a Harvard graduate who became the first black judge in the state of Massachusetts. As the credentials committee informed her, she would be welcomed in the convention as a delegate from the white club to which she also belonged. In this case, of course, she would have been the necessary exception proving the rule of racial segregation within the GFWC. But since Ruffin insisted on representing the Black Women's Club, which, incidentally, had already received a certif certificate of GFWC membership, she was refused entrance into the convention hall. Moreover, quote, to enforce this ruling, an attempt was made to snatch from her breast the badge which had been handed her, end quote. Shortly after the, quote, Ruffin incident, the Federation's newsletter carried a fictitious story designed to frighten those white women who had protested the racism manifested within their organization. According to Ida B. Wells' account, the article was entitled, quote, The Rushing In of Fools, end quote, and it described the pitfalls of integrated club life in a certain unnamed city. The president of the unidentified club had invited a black woman, whom she had befriended, to become a member of her group. But alas, the white woman's daughter fell in love and married the black woman's son who, like his mother, was so light complexioned as to be hardly recognizable as black. Yet, the article confided, he had that, quote, invisible drop, end quote, of black blood 
And when the young white wife gave birth to a, quote, jet black baby, the shock was so great that she turned her face to the wall and died, end quote. While any black person would realize that the story was contrived, the newspapers picked it up and widely disseminated the message that integrated women's clubs would result in the defilement of white womanhood. I think that's another thing that should be pointed out here is that one of the uh, main, one of the biggest racist concepts or one of the biggest racist, uh, yeah, I guess, ideologies that was pushed during this time was that things like integration would lead to uh, the defilement of the race from uh, interracial marriage or from interracial uh, uh, children being born and that the only thing that uh, black people wanted to be integrated for was to uh, procreate or to uh, marry white people. And again, that was mainly done in an effort to... uh, in an effort to put this type of fear into into white women in an effort to put some type of anger uh into into white men in an effort to uh further criminalize or further dehumanize uh black people specifically black men to to build up this this fear of uh of black men uh raping white women and and that's something that you know you see mimicked throughout uh heavily in the 1900s uh, when you get to things like uh, the Emmett Till being murdered, when you get to some of the cities where some of the cities where black people were run out in the South after an accusation would be made by a white woman of a black man uh, committing some type of sexual uh, assault crime. And a lot of those stories, as we've gotten into the 21st century, as we've gotten into the 2000s, a lot of those stories have been disproven and have been uh, shown that there was no sexual assault or sexual crime committed on these white women. These were just lies and excuses that were used to uh, murder and kill black people and still the, the lands that black people had. The first national convention called by black women had taken place five years after the 1890 founding meeting of the General Federation of Women's Clubs. Black women's organizational experiences could be traced back to the pre-Civil War era. And like their white sisters, they have they have participated in literary societies and benevolent organizations. Their main efforts during that period were associated with the anti-slavery cause. Unlike white women, however, who had also flocked into the abolitionist campaign, black women have been motivated less by considerations of charity or by general moral principles than by the palpable demands of their people's survival. The 1890s were the most difficult years for black people since the abolition of slavery, and women naturally felt obligated to join their people's resistance struggle. It was in response to the unchecked wave of lynchings and the indiscriminate sexual abuse of black women that the first black women's club was organized. According to the accepted interpretations, the origins of the white women's general federation go back to the immediate post-war period when the exclusion of women from the New York Press Club resulted in the organization of a women's club in 1868. After the founding of Soros in New York, Boston women established the New England women's clubs. Thus, the trend was set for such a proliferation of clubs in the two leading cities of the Northeast that by 1890, a national federation could be founded. In the brief span of two years, the General Federation of Women's Clubs had acquired 190 affiliates and over 20,000 members. One student of feminist history explains it in this way, the seemingly magnetic attraction these clubs held for white women. Quote, Subjectively, clubs met the need of middle-class, middle-aged women for leisure activities outside of, but related, but related to, their traditional sphere. There were, it soon became clear, literally millions of women whose lives were not filled up by domestic and religious pursuits. Poorly educated for the most part, unwilling or unable to secure paid employment, they found in club life a solution to their personal dilemma. End quote. Black women, North and South, worked outside their homes to a far greater extent than their white counterparts. In 1890, of the 4 million women in the labor force, almost 1 million were black. Not nearly as many black women were confronted with the domestic void which plagued their white middle-class sisters. 
Even so, the leadership of the black club movement did not come from the masses of working women. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, for example, was the wife of a Massachusetts judge. What set such women apart from the white club leaders was their consciousness of the need to challenge racism. Indeed, their own familiarity with the routine racism of U.S. society linked them far more intimately to their working class sisters than did the experience of sexism for white women of the middle class. Prior to the emergence of the club movement, the first large meeting independently organized by black women was prompted by the racist assaults on the newspaper woman Ida B. Wells. After her newspaper offices in Memphis were destroyed by a mob of racists who opposed her anti-lynching work, Wells decided to take up permanent residence in New York. As she relates in her autobiography, two women were deeply moved upon reading her articles in the New York Age about the lynching of three of her friends and the destruction of her paper. Quote, Two colored women remarked on my revelations during a visit with each other and said they thought that the women of New York and Brooklyn should do something to show appreciation of my work and to protest the treatment which I had received. End quote. Victoria Matthews and Marticia Lyons initiated a series of meetings among the women they knew, and eventually a committee of 250 women was charged with, quote, stirring up sentiments throughout the two cities, end quote. Within several months, they had organized an immense meeting, which took place in October 1892 at New York's Lyric Hall. At that rally, Ida B. Wells made a moving presentation on lynching. Quote, the hall was crowded. The leading color woman of Boston and Philadelphia had been invited to join in the demonstration and they came a brilliant array. Mrs. Gertrude Marshall of Philadelphia, Mrs. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin of Boston. Mrs. Sarah Garnett, widow of one of our one of our great men, a teacher in the public schools of New York City. Dr. Susan McKenna of Brooklyn, the leading woman physician of our race, were all there on the platform, a solid array behind a lonely, homesick girl who was in exile because she had tried to defend the manhood of her race. End quote. Ida B. Wells received a good sum of money toward the establishment of another newspaper and, a sign of the relative affluence of the campaign's leaders, a gold brooch in the shape of a pen. A gold brooch in the shape of a pen. In the aftermath of this inspiring rally, the women who had organized it created permanent organizations in Brooklyn and New York, which they called the Women's Loyal Union. According to Ida B. Wells, these were the first clubs created and exclusively led by black women. Quote, it was the real beginning of the club movement among the colored women in this country, end quote. Boston's Women's Era Club, subsequently banned by the GFWC, was an outgrowth of a meeting called Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin on the occasion of Ida B. Wells' visit to Boston. Similar meetings addressed by Wells led to permanent clubs in New Bedford, Providence, and Newport, and later in New Haven. In 1893, an anti anti-lynching speech delivered by Wells in Washington occasioned one of the first public appearances of many church of Mary Church Terrell, who later became the founding president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Ida B. Wells was much more than a drawing card for black women who were recruited into the club movement. She was also an active organizer, initiating and serving as president of the first black women's club in Chicago. After her first anti-lynching tour abroad, she assisted Frederick Douglass in organizing a protest against the 1893 World's Fair. Due to her efforts, a woman's committee was organized to raise money for the publication of a brochure to be distributed at the fair entitled, quote, The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Columbian Exposition, end quote. In the aftermath of the Chicago World's Fair, Wells persuaded the women to create a permanent club as black women in the northeastern cities had done. Some of the women recruited by Wells came from Chicago's most affluent black families. Mrs. John Jones, for example, was the wife of, quote, the wealthiest colored man in Chicago at that time, end quote. Oh, sorry, one second, I lost my page. It should be noted, however, that this successful businessman had formerly worked on the Underground Railroad and had led the movement to repeal Illinois's black laws. Aside from the women representing the incipient, quote, black bourgeois, end quote, and the, quote, most prominent women in church and secret society, end quote, 
there were, quote, school teachers and housewives and high school girls, end quote. Among the almost 300 members of the Chicago Women's Club, in one of their earliest activist endeavors, they raised funds to prosecute a policeman who had killed a black man. The black club women in Chicago were manifestly committed to the struggle for black liberation. Uh, and then for me, one of the things that last paragraph makes up to stand out to me, and that is the how how much at the forefront black women have been at when it comes to struggling and, and fighting specifically for the right for black men to exist, the right for black men to live when the state and when white mobs are killing them and trying to murder them, the the fight that black women have had for their fathers to be able to exist, the fight that black women have had for their their sons and their nephews and their cousins and their brothers to be able to exist. And I think that that's one of the things that is that has to become for for us as black men it has to become uh, part of our efforts in the future is to have that same uh, and it's to not say that no black men do, but just on a, a higher level to have that same type of adamancy for our, our black sisters when they, with the things that they have dealt with and the things that they continue to deal with. I think that one of the other things that is important to me or stands out to me is the the role that Ida B. Wells is playing as both a uh, reporter and reporting and journal, being a journalist and exposing the the lynchings that were going on in the South and also as being an activist and an organizer and trying to help her people be uh, mobilized to be able to struggle against this, this, the racism that was in the society, uh, the, and the importance in us having more black people who are, who can, who can add a activism and organizing to whatever it is that they are already doing, whether that's working a nine to five job, whether that's uh, someone who's an entrepreneur, whether that's someone who's uh, a musician or an artist, whatever it is, finding a way to add at that activism, add that organ organizing onto, onto, uh, onto their plate because of the importance it holds for us as a community, because of the significance that it holds for us as a community and the voice that Ida B. Wells had, because people would listen to her because of the uh, prominence she had in the community. It, it, it assisted, uh, it assisted the community as a whole for her to be one of the people that was doing this work. And it showed, it gave it, and it gave a leading by example type of, uh, a leading by example type of uh, platform as well. And so just as I've learned more, I've learned about Lucretia Mott through reading through this book, just as I've learned more about Sojourner Truth, just as I've learned more about Frederick Douglass, learned more about Susan B. Anthony, uh, just as I've learned uh, about Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, just all of these different, and it's, I'm still missing some people, some individuals, all these different individuals who I have learned more about when it comes specifically to the ways that they contributed for contributed to black women's liberation, contributed to uh, black women's suffrage, to uh, to to the movement of black liberation and also women's liberation. And so we're going to we're a little bit over 30 minutes here. We're going to end this episode right here. I want to encourage people to go back and listen to previous episodes of Rock for Reading Daily if they have not listened to them. Uh, we began by reading Black Have Black Lives Ever Matter by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. Then we read Race Matters by Cornell West. Then we read Citizens, Cops and Power by Steve Herbert. Then after that, uh, me and another member of the May 30th Alliance read through an essay on civil disobedience. Uh, by Henry Thoreau, and now we are currently reading Angela Y. Davis' Women, Race, and Class, and I think we're about, I think we're about halfway through. Hold on, let me see. Let's see, we're on page 132, and there are two, how many pages? 244 pages. So, yeah, we're a little bit more than halfway. Oh, no, we almost halfway, almost about halfway through. All right, share this episode on whatever platform you're listening to it on. And remember, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to present people the opportunity to begin and to further their struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. <laughs>